Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching. Please hit that like and subscribe button and that notification bell to stay up to date on all the videos that I'm releasing. And today, we're going to be talking about a very, very, very important subject. And that is whether or not Christians should vote. Now, I can't tell you how important this is because there's people out there today that say that the church and the state should be completely separate and that Christians should not be involved in government in any way, shape, or form. And can I tell you that the people who are saying this are the evil people. And they're saying this because they don't want the church involved with government because they desire that evil things would happen in the government and that they would have full control to be able to do whatever evil things they want to do in the government. And so they say to all of us, oh, it's not right that church and state should be involved together, and it's not right that these things should be working together, because they know that the church is a light, and that Christians are the light of the world. That's what we're called to be. And so if the light of the world goes into a place where there's much darkness, what's going to happen? It's going to become light. It's going to become a good thing. And they don't want it to be a good thing because they know that when good is around, that evil cannot abound. You see, light is a super special thing in this way, that when there is light, there can be no darkness. For the scriptures tell us that the light came into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. But what happens when there's an absence of that light? Then there is darkness. But did you know that there's actually no measurement for darkness? Darkness is simply the absence of light. But there is a measurement for light and how much light that there is. And so it gives us this great example of how God has set things up. When there is light, there's light everywhere. Think about it when you walk into a dark room and you flip the light switch on. All the darkness goes away, right? But when that light switch is off, darkness can abound everywhere. And it's the same thing, not just in government, but in our culture and our society today as well, that when the light is not present, darkness can abound. But when the light is present, darkness can't do anything. It can't overcome that light. And so since the French Revolution, Hundreds of years ago, people have been calling for the separation of church and state. And I know that the Catholic Church did some very, very evil things in that time. But that, that didn't constitute what happened after they did separate the church and state. Because then the state came after the church and the people of the church and started killing them all. So was that not an evil thing? Of course it was an evil thing. And so church and state are always together, whether people like it or not. And Christians should always get involved because Jesus called Christians to be the light in government, in a society, in a culture, in a family, anywhere that we go, we're called to be the light. And so when we come to this question of should Christians vote or not, the answer is absolutely Christians should vote. Absolutely Christians should get involved. And stick around to the end because I'm going to give you some absolutely remarkable statistics. The, the numbers of how many Christians vote, how many Christians don't vote, and the margins of who gets elected and who doesn't. So stick around for that. Now, I also want to say here that government and all authority is from God. And we as Christians need to be an example to be obedient to authority. Because this is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Did you catch that? Whoever resists the authority Resist the ordinance of God. God is the one who put these things into place. God is the one who put government into place. 
Why? Because he knows that a nation, that people need leaders. And even a bad leader in government is better than no leader at all. Now, this was fascinating. I actually watched a documentary on Saddam Hussein. And as you know, he was the leader of Iraq for a lot of years from like, I don't know, the 1970s all the way up to almost 2000, I think 2003 is when they finally captured him. So he was a a leader, the leader of Iraq for a long time. And he did some terrible, terrible things, killing tons and tons of people, like ruling with an iron fist and even killing people that were close to him doing just disgusting, disgusting things. But what I thought was fascinating about this particular documentary is that they were interviewing a servant of Saddam Hussein. And this servant said that Saddam Hussein had killed basically his whole family, his parents, his siblings, uh, his kids, like a lot of his family was decimated by Saddam Hussein. And at that time, the U.S. stepped in and said, this guy is, uh, he, he's doing things that are totally egregious and we need to step in and remove him from, from power because he's basically doing war crimes, crimes against humanity. But what happened was, is after the U.S. captured Saddam Hussein, it left this opening in the government to where Iraq didn't have a ruler. And what this guy said was so fascinating. He said, you know, as bad as it was under Saddam Hussein and the fact that he killed my whole family was disgusting and terrible. But he said, since Saddam Hussein was captured and taken away, the government has become even worse and our society has been even worse. And the reason is, is because now there's dozens of Saddam Hussein's out there vying for power, killing people, murdering people all over the place. And so instead of having one person doing all this work, now you have dozens of people doing this work, doing these egregious crimes, trying to vie for this powerful position over Iraq. And so you can see right there just that one example. It's it's a steep example, I get it. But you can see right there in that one example how important government is and how important it is for us to have a leader because a leader is a person who creates order. Even if they're disorderly, they create order. And I think this is the reason that a lot of Christians stay out of government and they stay out of even voting in the U.S. is because they don't think there's a good enough candidate that all the candidates out there are just as disgusting and egregious and they can't align with a Christian value or a Christian morality. And so they decide, well, I'm just not going to vote at all. But I want to challenge you with this because not voting at all is actually voting. Not voting at all is voting for no one, which means your vote doesn't count for anything. And God has given us a specific purpose to this world, just as I was talking about earlier. As a Christian, we are called to be the light of the world and we are called to move the will of God forward and move the purposes of God forward and to make sure that the government and the people and the culture don't go against the ways of God, but that we would be a light to them in going after God and being for God and for his word and for his will. And so if you don't vote, you don't have the opportunity to do that. You saying, I'm not going to vote, takes away your opportunity to change this world and to change this country. And in the U.S., we know that changing this country does change the world. Because in the issues that we have in our country, those issues spread to other nations super quick because they're looking at us as an example. And so if our nation doesn't have an example to follow after, then we have no way to draw the nation to God. And so, yeah, I know that it's difficult to find the right candidate to vote for. And I know it's been said that you're picking the lesser of two evils. And yeah, that's true. 
a lot of times. But a lot of times it is a much lesser vote for evil than the other one is. To vote for one candidate, you're voting for a much lesser evil than another candidate. And in a situation like we have right now in our nation, we have three main issues as I see it. We have immigration, we have abortion, and we have the family unit, which I would consider to be uh, the, the gay trans music, um, uh, gay trans movement and homosexual movement, all those things all wrapped into one. Those are the three main issues. And so if we have these three main issues and we have a candidate that is a lesser evil in those things, then I absolutely believe that you shouldn't waste your vote, then that you should vote for the lesser of those two evils. I mean, abortion in our nation today is ridiculously over the top. And now we have a candidate who wants to make it even worse, who wants to say that you can abort a baby even after it's born. After you've had a child who is now a living, breathing human being out of the womb, no longer a part of your body, which is how they've justified this the whole time. Oh, it's a part of my body. Now it's outside of your body and they're still wanting to give the mother the right to abort that baby and to kill that child outside of the womb. It's like, how disgusting can you get? But did you know that the majority of abortions happen within the first four months. I think it's like 95% within the first four months is when those abortions happen. And look, I just want to say, if you've had an abortion, which I know there's a ton of women out there, I think it's 65 million abortions that have happened since the induction of Roe v. Wade, which wasn't even that long ago, but 65 million babies have been aborted since then. And if you are one of those women who have aborted a child, I want you to know that the only thing that you should find your hope in now is in Jesus Christ. Because that abortion does not define you anymore. The blood of Jesus Christ covers that sin. But now he is calling you and he's calling all of us to stop other people from doing the same thing and making the same mistake. Because I know that that abortion still affects you today in a negative way. And it hurts your heart to think about it. And you should be the one standing up for other women and saying, don't do this to your child because you're going to regret it. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith and in love and in patience, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, but teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. You see, it's the older generations that are supposed to teach the younger generations how to live their lives because the older generations have made their mistakes and yet they need to be following the commandments of God so they can teach the younger generations not to make those mistakes and to follow the commandments of God themselves. And so God has a great plan for all of us who have made mistakes in this life. It's to teach the younger generations to not make those same mistakes. And we're seeing this right now in the family as well, in the homosexual, homosexuality and trans movement. They even now, there's candidates now, in fact, Walls is one of them, who in his state has made it so that a person cannot tell their child whether they're a boy or a girl. And if they don't affirm to their child, if if the child wants to be a boy or a girl, let's say they're a girl and they want to be a boy and they want to have this uh, um, a trans surgery or something like that, and the parents don't affirm that trans surgery or that transition in any way, no matter how young the child is, 
The government can come and take your child from you so that that child can have this gender transition and is no longer under the thumb of their parents. Like, how disgusting is that? Look, we are all made in the image of God exactly how God wanted us to be. He said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't know if you've seen, but there's a lot of people who have had gender transitions who are now coming out a few years later and saying, this was the worst mistake of my life. And yet the government and the education system is now trying to catch these children while they're young, four, five, six years old, and tell them they can be whatever they want to be, and they can have a gender transition, and if they're a girl, they can go be a boy, and if they're a boy, they could go be a girl, because they know they are too young to be making a decision like that. And so they want to get them out of, of under the thumb of their parents, get them out of their parents' control, so that the government can now make this decision for them. Look, I want to tell you something that's very frank, but it's the truth, okay? The government, and there's many people, I'm not saying the government as a whole and all the people in it, but I'm saying there's many people in the government and many people in the higher-ups of our society that want the population of the earth to go down drastically, and if they are subscribing to this idea, it means that they're going to do whatever they possibly can to make sure the population of the earth is reduced by huge, huge numbers. Huge numbers. And that includes this third one, immigration here. Because they know that letting the people over the border into our country, they're letting over people who are convicted felons, who are convicted rapists, who are convicted murderers, who are convicted drug dealers, and even the cartels themselves from Mexico because they're allowing anyone just to come in and not show any ID. Matter of fact, I have a friend who um, works in the medical industry and he was doing work for a manufacturer just over the border of Mexico. And he's from Germany and he came here on a work visa but he's been here 30 years, I think it's been now. Anyway, so he goes over into Mexico to work for this company, this manufacturer. A lot of American companies are moving their man manufacturing just over the border of Mexico because the labor is so much cheaper there. And so they've moved over there. He's going there to do work for them. He has to go over the border every single day to go to their manufacturing plant because he's staying uh, in San Diego, in California, but he's going over the border every day to work for them. And one day he shows them his visa. I think it was the first day to come back over the border into California. He shows them his work visa and they, the guy who he showed it to said, no, this isn't legitimate. I can't let you over with this. And he's like, what do you mean? I've been here 30 years on this visa. I'm working over the border of Mexico. That's why I'm here. And the guy goes, Hey, look, it's obvious that you're not an illegal immigrant, which doesn't even make sense, but it's obvious that you're not. So just don't show me your ID and you can come over the border. And he was shocked. He was like, wait a second. I have a work visa here that's legitimate and you won't let me over on this work visa. But if I just say I'm anyone and don't show you a visa, I can just walk across the border. And yes, that's absolutely correct. Right now, anyone can just walk across the border without showing any ID whatsoever. So when Kamala Harris says that, oh no, they've got this all under control. No, they don't. Anyone can walk across the border. In fact, I've considered it myself, being how taxes and insurances in this country and how uh, the citizens of this country have to pay for everyone else. I've considered just going across the border and coming back as somebody else to get everything paid for. But I don't know, I might wait a couple more years on that. Anyway, these are our three main issues. And look, I know there's tons of good people that are coming over, um, even illegally right now, and they want to be a part of our society and they want to do good for our society. But it doesn't discount the fact that they're letting over these convicted felons and rapists and murderers and drug dealers into our nation. And it's decimating our population. Look at how fentanyl has been decimating our population for a few years now. Where do you think all that's coming from? Out of this country. 
So think about that. Look at these stats about professing Christians and voting. Did you know that the last presidential election between Biden and Trump was decided by about 42,000 votes? 42,000 in a presidential election. But did you know that there's also about 30 million, 30 million professing Christians who did not vote in that election? Do you think that those 30 million votes could have changed that election? Of course. A little over 1% of those 30 million votes could have changed that election. Isn't that crazy? In California, where I live, our last governor's election was decided by less than 10% of the vote. And in a state of about 40 million people, don't you think if the Christians of California voted that it could have swung that vote too? Of course. So your vote does matter. Your vote does count. Look at how all these things are happening so quickly and the people of our nation are waking up and saying, no, we can't keep going down this way, down this uh, freight train of darkness and going down with the ship as the government of this nation are trying to get us to go. We have to wake up and we got to do something different. And you're seeing people shift their vote and understand that they can't go that way anymore and they have to come back to the Lord. So now your vote matters more than any other time. I think in the history of this nation, your vote matters because it's deciding which way this nation goes, excuse me, from here on out. But I want you to understand one thing that is so much more powerful than voting because the other hand of this is there's a lot of Christians out there that make voting everything and prayer nothing. But I can tell you, if you have an option to vote or to pray, you better take prayer. Because in prayer, you have the opportunity to seek the living God who is sovereign over all, who can do way more than your one measly vote. And he can change entire nations and change people's hearts. And he can even change the people's hearts who are in the government now. And that's why it tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Therefore I exhort, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So he's saying you need to be praying for all your leaders because God desires them to be saved too. And if they got saved, don't you think their policies would change? Of course they would. And that's what we have to be voting on is policies. We can't be voting because we like the personality of one candidate or another better, or we think one's better looking. This is not a, a popularity contest like you're in high school, okay? This is not a, oh, this was the homecoming king and the homecoming queen. No, this is for our nation. You have to vote on the policies. And if we want the will of God to happen in this nation, then you need to vote how policies line up with the will of God. I can tell you that the will of God does not want rapists and murderers and drug dealers to come into our nation and kill people. I can tell you that God does not want women to be able to kill their unborn child in their womb. And I can also tell you that God does not want the family to be broken down. He wants the family structure to be in place, one man and one woman in holy matrimony and children from that holy mat matrimony. And he sure does not want his perfect image that he has made us in to be trampled on by homosexuality and by transsexuality. No, he has made us all in his glorious image. And he wants us to live in that glorious image, even if we don't feel like we're that person or not. He has made us exactly how he wanted to make us. And so we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray that people would see the light. As Christians, we are the light of the world. 
And we need to pray that people would see that light and they would step into it and that they would do everything they possibly can to make sure that the will of God and the purpose and the plan of God would happen in their nation. And that includes by voting. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, this is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. It says, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear from heaven and I would forgive their sin and I would heal their land. I would heal their land. Do you want your sin to be forgiven? Do you want your land to be healed? Of course you do. You need to get on your knees and you need to pray to God that God would do that work and that he would use you in all and by all means necessary to make his perfect will happen on this earth. God is so much more powerful than men. He is so much more powerful than, moti- than voting. And you need to put your faith, hope, and trust in him. And in, you, you've seen the way this nation has gone in just the past few years. You need to put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can save you. You can vote until you're blue in the face, and it would change this world. But the moment you die, all that is for naught. So you need to think about that. Think about the fact of what happens to you when you die. If you die apart from Jesus Christ, you are not going to heaven. I don't care what Oprah says. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It's exclusive, not inclusive. Jesus Christ is our exclusive Savior. And if you haven't trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that now. Because you don't know. You could walk out of your house. You could be watching this video on your phone right now, walking down the street, and a car drive by and hit you, and you're gone. So take this as a warning. All you have to say is, Jesus Christ, I trust in you as my Lord and Savior. I I know I'm a sinner, but I know you can forgive my sin because I know you died on the cross for my sin, and I'm trusting in you for my eternal salvation. And that's it. You will be saved. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's it, and that's all. The thief on the cross was not baptized. He... uh did not do a bunch of good works. He, In fact, he didn't do anything. He was a thief that died on the cross next to Jesus. And all he said to him is, Lord, today when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said to him, surely today you will be with me in paradise. It was that simple. It was that simple. That's all salvation is. And then once you have that salvation, step into the purpose and plan that Jesus has for your life and start walking with him. God bless you guys. We'll see you right here next time. Bye-bye now.